Hello and welcome to Dialogues in India's Quest. My guest today is a practicing psychoanalyst who has taught at universities in India, Europe and America. He's won numerous honors, including the Boyer Award for Psychological Anthropology. He's been a national fellow with the Baba Fellowship, the Nehru Fellowship and the ISSR Fellowship. I'm delighted to welcome Sudhir Kaka. Uh, Sudhir, what really is a job of a uh, psychoanalyst uh, working in, in, in the larger, larger realm that you do, both in terms of, you know, some of your time is spent dealing with patients and, and sort of helping people in, 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 in their sort of coping with, with their everyday lives, uh, and, and you also spend a lot of time writing on, on issues like violence, intimate relations, and what are these two functions, sort of two roles that you play? Well, one is the clinical role, Rajiv, and the clinical role is very simply a helping role, or I won't call it a healing role, but you help people to get to terms with their conflicts, their problems, to discover forms of creativity or mastery in themselves. And the other is the writing role where one uses the psychoanalytic theories, also adapts them to understand where we are in our social reality, so the Indian reality, and that has been always my great interest of, of what is our culture all about, or cultural psychology. Now both play into each other, without the practice, what my, not patients, one calls them clients, what they teach me, I won't be able to develop the hypothesis to test in the wider reality for writing. How long have you been practicing clinically? Uh, now it's 25 years, it's coming on to 25 years clinically, and I think uh, writing has been slightly longer, so about 27, 28 years. You trained to be an engineer, and you went to Germany, and, and, and how and why did psychoanalysis uh, enter your life? It, it, was, it was quite a switch, wasn't it? Uh, it was a switch in the sense because when I was growing up, and we are talking of uh, 50s, and it's 59, 58 when I did my bachelor's in engineering, uh, you had actually only three professions in our kind of uh, middle class, upper, the medicine, engineer, or the administrative services. My father was in the administrative services, so that was out. I didn't want to compete with him at all. <laughs> um, medicine, I couldn't stand the sight of blood, so engineering was the only profession left, so which I did engineering. Uh, but I always knew that I was not going to do it uh, for long. So after about two years, and when I went to Germany in a shipyard, I knew I was not going to do engineering, and I, what I wanted to do was philosophy, which of course created a great deal of consternation at home. I mean, nobody's ever earned money from philosophy. So we had going letters, going up and down, but since I was away from home and pressures, and from letters, people can't exert that much pressure. Mm -hmm. So that we, did, we came to a compromise that I would do economics instead, that economics is between engineering and philosophy, and maybe one can earn money. So I did my, then my master's, five years I spent in Germany doing economics. Uh, but of course I knew I didn't want economics too, <laughs> and that that was a compromise. But I'd already started studying, reading, psychology, and of course literature, which psychoanalysis is very close to. And then when the chance came, which was in India, when I met a psychoanalyst, uh, a very well-known person who was writing book on Gandhi, and then I asked him, listen, I want to be this do this, what you are doing, how do I do it? And he said, well, just finish your doctorate, come and work with me, and we'll arrange. So I really shifted at the age of 30 to my career, which I've always wanted since the age of 16 or 17. What does a psychoanalyst do? Uh, there are three really kind of uh, differentiations which one can do. Psychologist, psychiatrist, and psychotherapist. Psychologist normally is what is an academic degree. You have your master's in psychology, your PhD in psychology, and you teach or study psychological things of uh, behavior, of uh, cognition. There are people called clinical psychologists who would then practice psychology in a clinical sense. Um, many of them would be doing testing of various kinds, IQ testing, testing of various personality kind of things. Uh, and but some of them will also do therapy. So when a clinical psychologist does therapy, trains, further trains for psych, then he becomes a psychotherapist. So psychotherapist can be a psychologist, but he or she can come from any other profession, social work, etc. And then treats or heals or deals with emotional disorders 
by one of these psychotherapy schools, and there are many of them. Psychiatrist is someone who has studied medicine, has specialized in psychiatry, and really, in India at least, most of them would be dealing with mental, emotional disorders from the organic viewpoint, mostly with treatment with drugs. So these are the three differentiations. Psychoanalyst is one kind of psychotherapist, a psychotherapist who has as basis the school of Freud, Sigmund Freud. So that would be a psychoanalyst. Uh, in the years that you've been uh, practicing largely in India, though you've been teaching all over the world, uh, what changes have you felt uh, in, in, in terms of uh, the willingness of, of, of people to reach out to therapy uh, and, and perhaps in the kinds of problems they, they confront? That has changed a great deal. I mean, I remember 25 years ago, anyone who came was a pagal, and there was a great deal of stigma. Uh, uh, you came very secretly. You never told people at all. Even your friends didn't know about it. And of course, if I met anyone of my clients outside, it was understood that we completely ignore each other. We don't even acknowledge each other's existence. That has been changing tremendously. And especially in the last three, four years, I find the demand for some kind of psychotherapy, right starting from the agony aunt columns of newspapers and magazines to the discussions of it in TV shows, etc., has increased tremendously. The stigma is still there, but much, much less. In, 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 in what ways do you feel that, that a, a, a Western view of the mind uh, really has an application uh, in India uh, in, 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 in treating conditions and problems that people here might have? The Western view of the mind, origins by itself do not damn any kind of system. I, I think you're quite right in, in uh, alluding to the fact that origins do influence the system, but otherwise uh, one would say one could think of uh, uh, monks having a conversation in Japan in 5th century that Buddhist meditation that is from Kerala, how does it apply here? So you see, so that I wouldn't say origins are the thing. But you have to do some kind of adaptations. Uh, the, there are some universal problems, I think, of human beings have by, by the virtue of being born as helpless children and needing and growing up with adults. So relationships. Uh, very important relationships with parents, siblings, these are almost kind of universal and the pain associated with this, these ones. They cause a great pleasure but also great pain. So these are kind of universal things which people come to whether it's West or India or anywhere. So what you do is that the universal ones, the view of the mind, I don't think differs too much. There are some kind of things where this culture part does come in, uh, questions of can talk about it later of autonomy of how much individuality how much relationships uh, how much a family should control you how much you should have your own way there i think the whole culture part starts coming in what are some of the dominant uh, cultural aspects that you feel that, that, that people confront today as opposed to 25 years ago in terms of your let's just stay with your clinical experience right. for, for now mm -hmm. um, what what what, what shifts do we see and, and how much of these shifts do you think are, are perhaps uh, responsible uh, or is there a relationship in the fact that, that India is now a free country, we have moved away from, uh, from colony uh, and, and, and there is uh, greater freedom and an opportunity to sort of express oneself. Do you see sort of relationships of this kind? Uh, yes, I think uh, looking back I would say there are some kind of relationships. So I think one big change we are seeing at least in the metropolitan cities. And that's really where the psychotherapies, the Western style psychotherapies are concentrated, is the whole problem of uh, individuality or individuation. Or put in other terms, a cast of mind where the family plays much less role, the conflicts around that have become much more. Do I wish for greater autonomy? How much autonomy do I wish for? versus obligations towards the family. I think that is the negotiations which have started taking place much, much more now in a much more conscious way, in much more reflective way than they used to be earlier, where the things were accepted much more. That is, I think, one of the broader changes which have taken place, also because of, certainly also because of opportunities. If your whole economic uh, well-being and your uh, what you were doing depended as being member of the family then you didn't move out of it you didn't have that opportunity but if there are opportunities to move out whether in professions or geographically 
then these kind of conflicts can also start. So, that certainly plays into it. Uh, another big change, I think one of the biggest ones is women. I think that is uh, uh, the much greater individuation of women, of their much greater sense of autonomy. Uh, that, I think, has been one of the biggest changes, because I think a lot of our earlier part or the earlier cultural life rested on many sacrifices which many women had to make and many women are refusing to make those sacrifices so that is of course making bringing the whole system again into some kind of uh, turbulence i think there's sort of two different uh, ways uh, two different areas here sort of the family and women uh, if if we were to look at the the, the problem of the family would you say that uh, that uh, psychoanalysis or the kind of therapy that you're doing is really uh, is, is seeking to help people cope to what is really a reactive situation. There's a societal change, put the pressure on the family, I'm miserable, I come to try, come to you to try and come terms, come to terms with my situation. Psychoanalysis itself is very, perhaps the most strongly individual oriented therapy. The individual is the center. So my responsibility as analyst is only to the person who's sitting in front of me that I'm, I'm not responsible for directly for parents, not interest for parents, family, society, nothing at all. The interests of this individual are the most important for me. And of course, uh, what one tries to do is to increase the freedom of choice. It's not increasing coping or happiness to give the person through the, after a lot of talk, that he or she gets this feeling that there are choices available. Then what he or she chooses whether in the family, how to, whether to cope, adapt, in what degree, are absolutely choices of the person. But he or she has to know uh, that there are these choices available. Do you ever get involved or play a role in, in sort of uh, the morality of those choices? No, uh, psychoanalysis is a very, in that sense, an amoral profession in the sense because morality is what so many people suffer from. Uh, ethics is different. Uh, you know. But morality, the sense of oppressive, where you have no choice, that kind of morality is something which psychoanalysis, I think, through its history, has undermined and tried to undermine that morality is, are the kind of, those gods are not its gods, that the icon iconoclasm is a very important part of it. So that is certainly not a part of psychoanalysis. Could you elaborate the difference between morality and ethics? Uh, morality is, again, I think, uh, the, what is what you feel is imposed, what you have to do. Ethics is what you have chosen to do. So I think the difference is really the freedom of choice. Uh, it, the actions can be the same, but what is inside how you do them, whether it, you have freely choose to do them or whether you, you feel as it an imposition. So would it be fair to say that, that, that when, when a patient comes to you with a, with a, with a problem uh, within the family, that, that are you sort of uh, empowering him, helping him, him to understand, uh, to gain insights, uh, to find solutions. Uh, what is the interaction that you have with him? He, you know, our, our traditional image is that he comes back on a couch and he sort of lies down on, on the couch and you sort of listen passively mm -hmm. and allow him to uh, articulate his, his thoughts and mm -hmm. ideas and you neutrally steer him mm -hmm. uh, so that he's able to, to see reality for what it is. Mm -hmm. Is that a fair description? It is a, it is a fair description. Uh, yeah, in fact, I think it's a very fair description. Uh, what you are trying to do is that, yes, he or she talks, uh, talks of his or her life, but there are some kind of blind spots which he or she may not see, and, these, and some of them are not even perhaps conscious, uh, but you start seeing some patterns, and you point out those patterns which he or she has missed. Uh, so you make the story complete uh, instead of something which were not hanging together, so that it becomes a coherent story, a consistent story for him and her. And then, of course, if you have your story, you are free to, aha, this is me, now I can choose. Uh, does it sometimes, uh, but how do you, 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 you penetrate the layers of one's self-deceptions, perhaps? Uh, I would hate to say that I penetrate them. <laughs> uh, it is always seen as absolutely joint work, uh, that, uh, that we try to penetrate the layers of uh, self-deception the layers uh, which are which are really imposed and are not your own, which you thought are your own. So yes, all kind of layers of absences which are tend to be filled. But, but yes. again, as 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 a layperson, 
Uh, aren't there disorders where people are not able to confront reality? And, and when you confront reality, it's, it's, it's so much of a shock that that leads to a disorder too? Uh, well, psychoanalysis is really limited not to the very kind of uh, what is it called the psychotic disorders, uh, which uh, people generally call madness, which uh, where there's complete break with reality. Psychoanalysis is, cannot deal with it. You really need to have a kind of a quite a bit of healthy functioning where you can talk, where you can see, and where when disturbing news are brought, you can, you will be upset and anxious, but you will be able to take it in. So you need kind of an intelligent, reflective person. In fact, unfortunately, it is a treatment for very healthy people. <laughs>